Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 28. I'm Doug Barak, joined by my co-host Chris Mulholland of Nets Daily, and our special guest. Our guest is a content creator, podcast host, and on-air talent for John Boy Media. We welcome Hudson Flynn to the podcast. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to join Doug and I. What's going on, man? Not much, not much. Anytime, guys. Anytime you guys want to have me on, have me come on and talk, um, I'm always available. I love you guys. I've, I've admired your podcast from afar for a while now, and you know, interacting with you guys on Twitter is always is always fun. So I'm I'm happy and blessed to be on the podcast today. I'm glad to hear that, and I'm glad we have that in recording, so we can keep replaying that moment over and over again. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. But I guess we could start off by saying what you've been up to since COVID nineteen put the world at halt, especially the sports world. What you've been up to? Well, uh, I guess just like everyone else, the answer is not really too much. I've been doing what I can to make sure everything is you know, good health-wise on my end and my family's end. I, uh, I moved back upstate, back home uh, to be with my family during quarantine. And not like I had much of a choice. I was rather unceremoniously kicked out of the city by uh, <laughs> Fordham College. So now I'm up home doing my best and... Uh, Keith and I, my co-host on Talking Nets, we're uh, we're doing what we can. We're grinding. We're getting things done. And I think, you know, just like everyone else, I'm excited for sports to return, not just because I'm a big sports fan, but also because it it kind of brings back a sense of normalcy, a sense of life can go on amidst this pandemic. Most definitely, yeah. most definitely. Yeah, that's very well said. And what kind of things you'd be doing since you've returned home? Well, I've been I've been working. Obviously, school never stopped. School went until it finished. But I've been <laughs> just doing my best to uh, to to keep me and my family safe. And then, um, you know, work wise, Keith and I have really been really been putting our nose to the grindstone, doing things on the back end to make sure uh, our podcast can move forward. Our social media can move forward. <laughs> spent a lot of long hours working on Photoshop, trying to perfect our templates, doing all that kind of that back end stuff, which, you know, as an 18 year old, not really having been involved in this business for too long was something that I didn't know was, you know, as labor intensive, as serious as it is. And that's been something that we've really been working hard on, really trying to drill down our stuff like that. So that's mostly been it. Just work, just just passing the time, really, until we can get back to uh, a sense of normalcy. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Um, so as you mentioned, you go to Fordham College. So what was it like uh, picking that uh, school and what major or and or minor have you been working on since starting there? Well, it's funny. The, uh, <laughs> the story that brought me to Fordham is um, I wouldn't call it a very normal one. My, uh, my father is currently, uh, he's deployed, he's overseas, he's in the Army. And he knew that before, you know, before I, he, I decided what college I was going to, he knew that he was going to be gone. And he knew that he wanted me to be at least, you know, available and around for my mom and my little sister, just in, in case anything happened or just, you know, so that they can visit and they can see me and not feel like, you know, two members of their family are completely out of their lives. So my father, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better word, made me look at schools that were a little closer to home than I was initially, initially planning planning on. I had been very to a lot of uh, the West Coast schools, uh, Northwestern even, if we're looking in the Midwest. But, you know, uh, on a whim, on one day, just when I was like, I have nothing better to do, uh, I was like, all right, let's go visit Fordham. He, he had advocated for it. He had mentioned it was in the city, and I had done some research, and I saw, oh, there's some pretty, some pretty interesting names have gone to Fordham. Vin Scully has gone to Fordham, if we're looking at the Nets, Ryan Rucco has gone to Florida, Mike Breen. So, you know, being someone who is interested in sports and, you know, maybe thinking about moving into sports broadcasting or something like that as a career, that was obviously a big, a big moment for me to see that these people had gone. And then when I visited, I, I knew that that was the place I wanted to be. I knew New York was you know, the one place in the world that I think I felt the most at home. I had lived in New York previously, as <laughs> me and Doug have talked a lot about on Twitter. Uh, I am f from Brooklyn initially, lived in Carroll Gardens, and going back to the city really showed me that that was where I belong. And 
when I got the chance to see that, when I got the chance to visit, I really realized that there is no, there was no better place for me. There was no better program for me when it comes to the Fordham Journalism program. And I really just, I, I, I felt like it was going to be a good home for me. And, you know, having spent a year there now, or at least half a year there now, all things considered, I really think I was right. I, I found that it was a great home for me. And I think that really my my being at Fordham is one of the main reasons that I was able to even become involved in John Boy Media in the first place. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And can you talk about your journey as a whole thus far? I know you're very young in your career and in general, making me feel old right now. But can you talk about that? Um, basically, as you mentioned, you already mentioned Fordham, but everything else that's gone on thus far that you, led you up to where you are today? It's funny. It's funny. I, I actually have been asked that a couple of times recently to talk about my journey. And it, it, I feels, be an it, feels, weird. <laughs> it feels weird for me to talk about because, you know, I am only 18 and uh, I feel like most of my journey was, you know, <laughs> lunchables and playing youth soccer at this point. So it... <laughs> But no, I think that there's been a lot of things that have drawn me to the point that I am now. Obviously, you know, sports has been a big, a big, you know, draw for me my entire life. Ever since, ever since I was four, I think really was when I really began to take a big interest in sports. And my father really showed me, <laughs> showed me sports, and he he showed me, you know, just how impactful they can be and how important they can be and I was drawn to sports you know very early on I played sports my entire life but I really I became to it for lack of a better word I I watched everything I learned everything if you if you ask me what sport I like to watch it's it's hard to say because I watch all of the major sports in the United States I watch European soccer I watch international rugby and I it, you know I'm just an addict. And it, it took me a while and it really took me coming to Fordham to realize that that is more than just a hobby. That's more than just something that I do in my spare time for fun, that it can be something that you can make a life out of, that you can work on, you know, outside of just, oh, you know, I got home, I had a long day, let me just turn on the Nets game, let me just turn on the Yankees game. And coming to Fordham really showed me that being in the city and being at a school with so many connections, there are opportunities that you can have to grow and expand yourself into, into this world. And frankly, it's a world that's rather difficult to break into. So boredom has really given me those opportunities so far. And like I said, I've only even been there in person for about six months. Yeah, so no, that's that, quite amazing. It's, it's really been amazing. It's been an amazing experience for me to be able to to go out and expand into a world that I really didn't think existed. I, I hadn't given it much thought previously, but I didn't know how people, you know, enter the sports world. And, you know, you on your podcast have obviously heard the stories of so many people and how they enter the sports world. And I think it's a great thing that you guys are doing this podcast because a lot of people don't know that. And to me, even a year ago, I didn't know that. If you look at, you know, some of the greats, like Ian Eagle, the, uh, the Nets play-by-play -play announcer, one of the greatest play-by-play -play announcers that we have talking sports like right now. I, it, it was almost hard for me to think of him as you know just a person and not this celebrity status that he's become, but he has like everyone else. And him talking about how he went to Syracuse and got lucky and got an internship at a local CBS affiliate because he was doing the radio play-by-play -play for a local high school JV football game. It really showed me, and a, a lot of things like that have really showed me that it's possible to move into this world, and I think that that is really where it's brought me to today, having moved into John Boy Media, having expanded into this, this career path, into this world that I really thought was completely closed off to me, and more importantly than all of that, expanding onto this podcast. Yeah, no, definitely. And is John Boy Media your first... Uh social media, sorry, sports media position or internship? It is absolutely my first sports media internship. So and I don't can you know talk I, about how you got there? Yeah, I, I was good. I was worried. I didn't want to jump ahead of any of your no, questions. No, go ahead. But jump so jump away. My, uh, my journey to uh, John Boy Media is a little less orthodox than most people's journey to any 
internship to any 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 job path. I was uh, I was seventeen. It was so it was last fall before my birthday. I was just on Twitter, and this was before having an actual you know personally created Twitter profile. I just had a burner that I used to follow sports. It didn't have a profile picture. I was literally the gray egg. And one day, I was scrolling around, and I saw Keith come out and say, listen, if there's anyone that wants to uh, you know, help us work on the social media for a new, a new account, a, a Talking Nets account, then you know, send me a DM, and we'll see what we can do. And so on a whim, you know, I realized, you know, I'm a, I'm a Nets fan and I guess why not? I have nothing else to ride to Boston at the time. And I was like, listen, I have nothing better to do. This will be at the very least entertaining. So I sent the DM and I pretty quickly became brought on as a social media intern. And I worked all the Talking Nets socials. I grew the Talking Nets brand. I created my own Twitter account and grew that a good bit, you know, in a short period of time. And just like that, Keith was, you know, having a vacancy for who was going to be his co-host on the podcast. And he tried out a lot of different people. He tried out some of his friends, some people in the industry, even some, you know, some credentialed reporters. And I just got lucky that one day he didn't have anyone to talk, uh, to talk nets with him. It was, if I believe it was episode 11 of talking nets and at that point we had had a very sporadic release schedule we hadn't been on any kind of a a a schedule or anything regimen he didn't have anyone scheduled for that day so that day up he just sent me a text and said you want to come on and talk nets with me and i was like sure why not and uh, little did i know i guess that served as my my tryout more or less and uh, a couple months later once the nba season started going once i was back at fordham Keith said, hey, we're going to keep it in-house, and I think that you can talk Nets well. I think that you have uh, a good personality, a good cadence on the microphone. Would you like to come on as the full-time co-host? And I said, absolutely. And then there I was. I was a, an 18-year-old working in a, you know, a burgeoning sports media office with people with, you know, hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, you know, connections to media networks and all of these things. And I was just kind of there as an 18 year old. And since then, I've really, I've really grown into the role, I think is something that Keith has really allowed me to do. He, he was aware, obviously, of the fact that I was 18, that I was, in a word, unpolished. And he allowed me to grow into the role to, you know, create a, a more refined cadence on the microphone to become more eloquent than I already was. And while I can't give Keith all of the credit because I can't inflate his ego any larger than it already is, he really was one of the reasons that I have been able to develop, you know, the type of cadence that I have, the type of microphone presence that I have. And to this day, you know, the process hasn't stopped. We're still working. If, if Keith hears something in my, in my hosting that he thinks is sloppy or he doesn't like, he points it out and then it's gone for the next episode. So I think that really has been a boon for me. I think it's the kind of opportunity that not many people get. And I, I was absolutely very lucky to get because if I had gone the tradition, gotten a media internship through an application and ended up, you know, wherever, let's just say I ended up at the Yes Network, if I get lucky, then what would I be? I'd be a production intern. I would just be getting coffee for people taking notes. I wouldn't be on the microphone. I wouldn't be developing this type of cadence, this type of rapport with people in the industry. And it, it's really just a credit to Keith and to John Boy Media that they were willing to take a shot on, on me. And I think I have done my best so far to, to, make, to make good on that shot and to <laughs> help Keith grow the podcast to where it is now and beyond. Well, I'm glad you didn't throw away your shot, similar to Hamilton. Absolutely not. I love Hamilton. I oh my god, <laughs> Keith. I, I I was one of my show recommendations at the end of one of the uh, of the last podcast, one we recorded over July Fourth weekend, and I said, "Listen, listen to Hamilton. Watch Hamilton." And he did, but he wasn't as big as I was, and honestly, I took it a little personally. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I watched it for the first time and, you know, followed it for the first time when it came out. Um, I guess I took your advice, even though I was planning to watch it anyways. Um, it was very long for me. Uh, the first half was definitely my favorite. Um, maybe I should have watched it in two parts, but I still listen to the soundtrack uh, quite a bit. So I guess that's one of the benefits of uh, quarantining life and such. But yeah, gl- glad you didn't throw away your shot, like I said before. <laughs> I did yeah, my best. Good. And the good thing, too, I was going to mention, too, as someone that started kind of getting their footing in the field around your time, 18, 19 years old, I can't even praise you enough, man, because, like, especially this field's all about experience and, like, who you know and everything like that. And the earlier you start is the more kind of footing you have underneath you. So it's great that you're getting into it. And kind of to back to kind of piggyback off what you just said and talking about the Talking Nets pod and how you got into it, especially with John Boy Media and all. How is it like hosting the podcast with Keith, who was our last guest as well, which the episodes will be released on the same day. So I just wanted to get your kind of thoughts, what's it been like hosting it with Keith and kind of any of your favorite stories and everything like that. Well, Keith, (laughs) Keith is fun. Keith is, is very good at what he does, but what he's very good at is making it not seem forced, making it not seem too serious. He's, (laughs) He's he's a funny guy, and when when you do get on the microphone with him, you kind of just have to roll with whatever punches that he throws you. For me, that was a a big thing that I had to learn quickly. Is that Keith will set me up beautifully. He he will lob the pitch up, and I will, all I have to do is hit it out of the park. So, you know, talking with him has been <laughs> has been pretty great. Stories wise, I think it's really just a credit to Keith that we haven't haven't had too many stories we do our best to do properly but I think if I did if I did have to choose one story I think it would be it would be remiss for me to not talk about like I mentioned earlier when we when we had Ian Eagle on the podcast for those of you who don't know he's the Nets play-by-play analyst but he also is one of the main uh, CBS college basketball analysts he does um, a lot of AFC NFL football games. He is, I believe, the number two team for a, uh, the AFC football when it comes to CBS. And he is uh, a titan in the industry. And so having him on, I was understandably a little anxious. And I w- didn't know how he was going to be because this is beyond a point of being a local host. He's a true you know, national celebrity. He, you know, he goes to the ESPYs. He's involved in all these things. And I, I was a little anxious. I mean, you know, sometimes it really shines through that I am still 18, that I am prone to getting a little starstruck sometimes. And talking to him, I was worried that I, he was going to come on and I was going to freeze up or ask the wrong question. And I came on the, uh, the Skype and I was thinking that I was just going to join the Skype early. I was going to keep it open. So if he joined, I'd be there. So, but I joined this guy five minutes before we're supposed to record. I was never thinking in a million years that he'd be early. And I open it, and he goes, Hudson. And I was like, ah, because I, I was absolutely not expecting him to be on there. And when he was, I was shocked. And before I could even say anything, he, he goes, Hudson, you're really growing in the lettuce. And I was like, what, what? And he was like, your hair. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been growing out the quarantine flow. And, you know, it, it's a credit to him that he was able to uh, to break down my barriers almost instantly. And, and I think it is it is underappreciated on air how funny and quick-witted of a guy he is. And oh, he's extremely I, I, genuine. I, oh, yeah. He, he's so genuine. And what we've heard from talking to all of the Nets on Yes people is that he is probably the nicest person in the business. He absolutely has no perceptions of his own star even though he is you know a national star in the industry so yeah no definitely it it was really great having him on and for him to be able to uh to joke me into submission when it came to my anxiety that's cool yeah and yeah Ian is one of the best in the business he's he's one of the most kind of down the earth guys you could talk to in the field i've had a couple conversations with him and he's one of the most down the earth people and kind of my follow-up question to that, I know it is early, and I know that you're kind of still getting your footing into the field and kind of getting what you get and everything like that. But who are some of your who are some of your mentors as of now 
and what was some of the best re- advice you've received? Well, obviously, I mean, the great, the, the most, the easiest answer is Keith. He's always been there for me throughout all of this. He's helped me grow. He's grown with me. He's grown me and the Talking Nets brand into something that was honestly larger than I ever expected it would be. So he's, he's a great mentor to have. He, <laughs> he's given me a lot of great advice. He's, he's told me <laughs> various great advices like, uh, stop being a clown, just have fun. And I, I, I took that to heart and I was, and this was when I was still early on. So I was like, okay, all right. Yeah. Whatever you say, Keith. And I think, I think wider than that, it, it has been talking to a lot of these people like Ian Eagle and he's been a mentor to me completely un, unbeknownst to him, just, you know, listening to him and modeling some of my cadence off of his, because why I model it after anyone else's, he's the best in the business. And, you know, talking to him, he gave some great advice, not just to me, but to everyone that is starting in the industry. And he just said, if you do it, love to do it. And when you do it, show that love. And that was something that I had never thought about. And obviously, I I love doing it. I enjoy doing it. But the audience can pick up when you're talking about something that you really want to be talking about, that you truly love. And Ian says that, he does his best to make sure that his love for the game, his love for his co-hosts, his love for everything shines through in in his in his talking on on air. And you're not wrong about that when it comes to spillage, wedgies, um, any little minuscule thing to the common fan or common eye, he makes into something so entertaining. Yeah, he shows it. He shows, you know, you can you know be yourself. You can be a polished, you know play-by-play analyst from Northwestern or one of these big schools and, you know, do all of that. But you can also have every, your, your personality and your love for the game come through. And like you said, Ian Eagle is the absolute person to look at when you, when you talk about that. He can, like you said, make anything hilarious. He, he is enjoying himself exactly as much as the listener is enjoying listening to him. And I think that's something that I have really tried to work on to allow some more of my personality, some more of my, you know, my jokes or my humor to to shine through on the podcast. When at the beginning, it I was almost nervous to a point where I was worried that I would say something wrong. So I came out sounding like I was a court reporter or something. And I was talking in the most droll, monotone voice that you've ever heard. But now I've been able to, to follow that advice and hopefully insert a little more of my personality into what I've been working on. And I think it's funny that we keep talking about Iron Eagle, but the last How could you say, not? I mean, yeah, his exactly. father, his father was a, known as a Catskill him. comedian, so he kind of had that edge. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think talking to him, his father uh, was one of his greatest influences. <laughs> Iron Eagle would open for him sometimes when he was you know, seven years old. He would open for him on stage. And I just think stories like that are, are why, you know, they show that you can, you can become something big from relatively, you know, relative obscurity. I mean, Ian Eagle, obviously he was, you know, involved in the entertainment industry because of his dad, but he was just a student at Syracuse that was doing his thing. And he parlayed that into something big. And it, it really, as much as it is cheesy to sound to, to, and to say, just do what you love to do. If you love something, you can make a career out of it. You can do whatever you want with it just because of that love, because of that passion. And Ian is obviously, you know, a pinnacle of that. And I think that's the greatest advice that you can give anyone, no matter what their field is, is if you love to do something, do it because that love will come through and that love will parlay itself naturally into into money or whatever it is that you need to be able to keep doing whatever that thing is that you love. Yeah, no, that's very well said. And we look forward to one day having Ian and his colleagues come on the pod um, soon. So really love the uh, hype up video. Well, not video, but comments you had. I was visualizing it. That's why I said video of how, you know, you everyone gets bubbly when you talk to or about Ian Eagle. So that's what my mind went to. Um, but switching gears uh, to the NBA. So when did you begin watching the league? Uh, what was your first memory? And what was your favorite team growing up? As you mentioned, it's been 
early in your life where covering sports kind of became an idea and really took over? Well, I think, I mean, when it comes to things that I've remembered, that's something else. But my first NBA game was a Michael Jordan Wizards game. That is an absolute fact. I was far too young to remember it. But uh, I can tell anyone who asked that I got to see Michael Jordan play in person for the Wizards. But I think it was really, you know, when I was younger and uh, Kobe and the Lakers really attracted me. Like, they attracted everyone. They were out on the West Coast. They were doing things. They were playing. They were having fun. And they were this such a distant commodity, you know, for me growing up in the East Coast. And seeing them was just like it was the coolest thing and whenever even when I was young and I was on my PS2 I would play the old NBA live games and I would use the Lakers and I you know you Kobe and it would be something that really that grew me to to love the NBA to love the high flying and just the level of talent that you see in the NBA that you don't necessarily see across other sports I mean at the in the NBA they're, it's so condensed. The rosters are so small. There's only five players in the court at one time. So they have to be the best of the best of the best in the world. And there's just so much quality. And that instantly attracted me to it. But I never had a team, really, until uh, 2012 when I saw that the Nets were moving to Brooklyn. And I was like, you know, I was born in Brooklyn. I lived part of my life in Brooklyn. What a better team to choose than to choose the Nets. And then they promptly... Uh, lost 70 games. And I said, okay, well, at least no one can say I'm a bandwagon fan. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's very that's very fair. I mean, I joined uh, their first season in Brooklyn, not really watching the sports, but it was my dad's team. So I do remember knowing of Jason Kidd because he would watch the games in my bedroom while I'd play video games, whether it Counter-Strike Source or something. But that's a very relatable story. Yeah, and so the Nets really really piqued my interest because I just thought they were such a, you know, the, they were they were kind of the lovable idiot for a little while there. I mean, the things that they did, the the moves that they made, completely discounting the, the trade in 2014, they were just a funny team to watch. And they had their moments. They had their fun times. And they really drew me to not necessarily the high-flying, high level of basketball that the Lakers did early on, but they drew me to, you know, the, the individuality of the NBA, the ability for players to, like, make their own of something and to have their personality, just like Ian Eagle has his personality come through doing what he loves. NBA players are absolute kings at doing that. They show their personality through whatever they do. I mean, if you look at the Nets now... Every time DeAndre Jordan gets an assist, and happy birthday to DeAndre Jordan as we record this. It's uh, the 21st of July. It's his birthday. He is now 32. Uh, yeah. Every time he gets an assist, he, um, he picks up the dime. And I, I just think that that's another thing that's unique to the NBA, and I think it's something that the Nets really attracted me to because, you know, watching a team fully and paying attention to their record and paying attention to their roster allowed me to just uh, become attracted to the characters and to the people and... I think that has led me to have a pretty unique view of the Nets, especially because regardless of what their record was, there were, were always characters on the Nets. Even when we had Jeremy Lin like there, and like Darren Williams and Joe Johnson, obviously these are great players, or at least in Jeremy Lin were at one time great players, but they have their own personality that shines through in the game that they play. And I think that is something that any fan of any team at any level can become attracted to and love to watch. This podcast episode is brought to you by Anchor. Anchor is an app that allows podcast producers to record and create original content. It is free to record and create a podcast, giving producers the ability to easily edit their material off their phone or computer. Anchor allows producers and talent to make money off their work with no minimum listenership. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you on platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. To get started, Anchor app or go to anchor.fm. Anchor for Doug and I has been great and allows us to bring unique, creative, and opinionated content to listeners of the Wingspan podcast. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. And then the transition a little bit into kind of what's going on today with the NBA bubble. 
Uh, my first question for you is, what are your thoughts on the NBA reviving their season? What's, like, your overall thoughts on it, especially considering how everything has developed since? Well, they did it. They did it, I think, as well as anyone else could do it. I think that they were able to set the model and have that model be a model that's hopefully never used again, but they absolutely handled it perfectly. They, as, as perfectly as they could, they had an, you know, impending money talks and CBA agreements that needed to be made, just like the MLB, just like the NHL needed to, but they were able to move past them and just put the, the ball in the hands of the commissioner and say, you run with it, you set us up exactly how you need to. And that's something that I think shows that the NBA leads and others will follow. They have a commissioner where you can do that. I don't, you're never going to see that in baseball with all the problems they have. In the NHL, Gary Bettman is a clown, and Roger Goodell is a bigger clown. So you're never going to see that in these other sports leagues. But for the NBA to have that is such an asset, and to have that kind of unity, and for them to very quickly you know, go out and show the NBA stands with these social issues. The NBA is not going to stand silent. And especially from a Nets point of view, the Nets did not stand silent when there were so many, you know, vocal social issues that needed to be addressed, you know, considering the large majority African-American players in the NBA. So I think it's just a credit to the NBA. I think that given the circumstances, they did absolutely as well as they could. And even with people in the clown, in the, in the bubble, like DeAndre Jordan, who are absolutely being, or not DeAndre Jordan, I'm sorry, uh, Dwight Howard, who is being an absolute clown, saying he's not going to wear a mask and he's not going to get vaccinated. They were able to come back yesterday on the 20th and say, we had no positive tests. Out of these 300-some players, no positive tests. And I think it just goes to show that the NBA has the ability to lead and to show the other leagues the proper way to do things, and they absolutely took the ball and ran with it. No, I like that. And then, as the guy gets to get into more depth about it, what have you liked so far? And where, if there are, what are some things that you d- dislike so far about like the well, plan, their plan? Well, I think, I mean, the plan wise, I think the plan is exactly as good as it could be. I think there's obviously going to be issues. I think, uh, as uh, one of my colleagues at John Boy Media said, uh, talking Jake, he said, uh, <laughs> you know, player, you know, young players are going to leave to go see girls. They're going to invite girls in we've seen girls say that they already so i think that there are some obvious issues with that there i mean we saw someone go out and pick up postmates and that's obviously going to be an issue so the human aspect there's always going to be problems there's always going to be people who don't take it seriously there's always going to be people who break it but i think on the administrative end aside from the limited uh social justice messages that players can have on their jerseys I really think they have handled everything about as perfectly as you could, all things considered. That's really my only big gripe I would have. Obviously, we all wanted to see a larger array of social justice messages. Uh, Jimmy Butler didn't want to wear his name on the back of his jersey, but that, that's probably not going to come back. He's probably just going to have to wear his name. So I think that is you know, the extent of the issues. But honestly, I think that they handled it exactly as well as they could have. I like that. And very well said. And then a little, a little. I guess you'd say the fun part of the bubble, which we have all seen, is kind of the NBA bubble life. That's how it's kind of been put from the T. Stiebel's content creation to the golf, the fishing, all that good stuff. So, what would you? Th- what are you? Th- what? What's your, kind of your thoughts on that? Kind of just seeing everything happen like that in the bubble. It looks like an AAU tournament. Yeah. It looks. Oh, yeah. It. It looks like, you know, when I was younger, me and my friends would, you know, go to a pile into a hotel and just mess around and. It shows that, you know, everyone has that kid in them, especially when they're at Disney World. And for them to just go out and have fun and do what they can, I think is absolutely amazing. I just, I hope and I pray that there are cameras following people around, just like there were for the last dance. Because in 10 years, and 20 years, the amount of content that could be parlayed into a 10-part documentary series is massive and even watching Matisse Thibel's vlogs or you know the the clips that the Nets put out it looks like they're all just kids having fun and what's wrong with that you know I th- it's just something that you can watch and be like you know as much as these people are you know the greatest athletes in the world 
the best best basketball players in the world. There's still people, and if you're and if you put a bunch of people, a bunch of friends alone in Disney World, they're gonna have a blast, and I think that they are, and I think that that's awesome. And I guess a, a fun question you could take this whichever approach we ask. We asked Keith the other day as well. Uh, what would it take for you to break quarantine in the NBA bubble? I know there there will be a financial penalty if a player breaks quarantine when seeding games begin on July 30th. Each game missed is projectively, I guess, around one percent of the salary. And you'll also be obviously required to stay in your room for 10 days plus. But as a, if you, whether you're a player, you want to take the player side or you want to take the media side for this question, what would it take you to break quarantine in the NBA bubble? Ooh, it makes me wonder now. I, now I, I really have to listen to Keith's episode because I want to know what he said to this. I mean, obviously there's the, there's the obvious answers you can, you know, death in the family, family emergency, wife's pregnant, all of these things. Mm-hmm. But the, the two the two fun ones that come to mind are uh, girls and food. Well, so, Keith was the first. Keith was the first one. He said his girlfriend. So Keith was the first one. Keith is the first one. I, I feel that too. I, I I think I would leave quarantine for my girlfriend if she if she said come over. Uh, I am not uh, in a in a position to say no. But, yeah, that makes sense. No, and, and then also uh, food-wise, I actually I think that's a no. I think that player on the Kings was a clown for leaving to get Postmates because the food's not that bad. All right, like it could be better. You don't have a personal chef there, but the food's not that bad. But and it, girls, yeah, and, 100%. Yeah, and as long as we keep bringing up this question, I have to call out Chris for wanting McDonald's to break the quarantine. That that oh, bar has set so low. Just I'm just gonna have to bring it up every time. That is the lowest bar I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> I'm just saying, three months, like a nice Big Mac's pretty good once in a while, you know. Like I'm just saying. Right, but I mean, I think <laughs> I, I just feel like who, I would obviously got... like break it for it, but I'm saying like you know, like it's, it'll have a little teaser going on it, but uh, <laughs> but you know, the chicken looks pretty good there. I'll give them that. I mean, that's just such a low bar. I mean, come on. Here's no. Well, now here's the question. If, uh, you know, when they when they reopened everything, when they allowed people to go out and get food and go to restaurants and sit outside, what was your first meal? Where was the first place you went? Oh, boy. Are we think. talking like in Orlando or are we talking just in general? No, in, 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 general. Real, in real life. In real life. Oh, in real life. Oh, I think I, I mean, went out. Yeah, I went out to get sushi with my guy friends. Yeah, I went out to get sushi. I mean, okay. Let's... I just wanted to make sure it wasn't McDonald's. That's all I was. Oh no, yeah, no. no, no, no. Oh yeah, no. For me, it yeah. was. Uh, I guess McDonald's it was... is the safe and reliable. She, yeah. For me, like more recently, the, my apartment was a uh, dinosaur barbecue, Cubana cafe, and hopefully soon order out some Lucali's pizza. Absolutely, and don't even get me started on dinosaur barbecue. Uh, I've been to the original dinosaur barbecue, and the second one that they created is actually. Uh, just across the river from me right now, I'm in Albany, New York, and in Troy, New York, is uh, the second dinosaur barbecue that they created. But I do love the one up in Chelsea. Yeah, it's so good. I have one uh, about 10, 15 minutes away from me walking. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's, I mean, it's great food. You can't beat dinosaurs. Nah. And then I got to ask you, too, this is a little fun question for you as well. Keith, Keith had to take a little bit of time to think of this, but he actually gave, at least in my opinion, the best answer we had so far. So, without putting any pressure, though, what are your five must-haves to bring to the bubble? Wait, uh, what, what would I bring in the bubble? Yeah. Five, five things. Five you could, things. You could stretch it to six. You could, but, like, five things. things. Well, this is tough because you got to think about what's already in the bubble, right? You don't want to bring something that's redundant. Yeah. And um, your phone is guaranteed, obviously. Yeah. Your- your phone is guaranteed. There's things there, and the five, and you can't include people in that, right? Nope. No, no people. Just, just items and stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, Boy. we're materialistic with this. Right, of course. Um, well, you didn't say no animals. Uh, my dog, my little. I have a little dog. He, it's he funny you be, mentioned that when bring... we when we first asked that question. Nolan's like, you know, what's the NBA's policy on dogs? And like, they haven't. We haven't seen anything said no, but clearly, no one brought their dog. So we'll 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 accept it. You'll allow it. All right, so number one on the list has to be my dog. Uh, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel my inner Joel Embiid. I'm bringing my Xbox. Got to bring the Xbox. Got to have, have some things I can do just in the room to chill. Number three. 
Bueno, this is where it starts to get tough because you really you really have to rule things out and think about things that you don't you don't have in the bubble. Because I feel like when when you go, there's all these things. Like even when you go on vacation, you realize, oh shoot, why didn't I bring that? Because you just thought, you know, that was something that that would be there. I would bring, and I don't know if this is possible. I would try. I would bring like a little, like a hot plate or something like that. Like a little. I, that's something. exactly what I said is one of mine. Absolutely. I mean, the the joy of making your own eggs in the morning is unrivaled. You can make yeah. the bacon, egg, and cheese yourself. You don't even need to go to the bodega. It's just all you need to do. So that's three. This is tough because I don't want to leave too much dead air in your podcast, but this is a, like a very difficult question. Oh, it's hard. Yeah, you got to th- Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's a hard one. Boy. Yeah, I mean, if there's any NBA players that inspired you, like for me, seeing what Myers Leonard brought into uh, that gaming setup was insane with just computers. So, or um, I guess, was it? Tucker, who brought his own TV. I so think you know, it's funny. I'm sitting. I'm sitting in my office right now, and I got a little bit of a setup. I got the two monitors. I got my laptop that I'm talking to you on. So I think. I think if I could bring the setup, that would be good too. And then, the last thing I think has to be. And this is going to sound dumb. This is definitely not going to be as good of an answer as Keith's. And I have to hear what he said after because you know I'm constantly not living up to his expectations. I would bring a pack of cards. Just a deck of playing cards, I think, is one of is just the easiest thing to bring. And I always have a deck of playing cards whenever I go anywhere on vacation because you never you never know who wants to play like a late night game of poker or something like that. And it's always something to do and you're always there. And no matter what, it's always fun. And I know and I'm gonna channel my inner MJ. It's all a competition, and we got some competitive folks down there and some competitive folks with a lot of money that they can throw around. So I think, I think a pack of cards is a way that I, I, could, I could win myself some money. I like it. I like it. I like it. And then I guess for the final question, I know, at least for talking about the bubble, I know at least a lot of things could happen from now till then. I know a lot of circumstances, rosters could be mixed up a little bit. You never know. Honestly, it's 2020. We're in a bubble. But if you did have to pick a team right now, who do you think wins it all? To win? I mean, I like the Clippers, if I'm being honest. I think I think the Clippers are probably my favorite my favorite good money team to win everything. I think that you know, once you see Kawhi in the playoffs, it's just a whole different beast. And I think as great as LeBron is, I think that team is starting to look a little depleted, and I don't know if you can really just run it with only LeBron and AD on the court and nobody else. I think you need those those helping pieces, and those are the kind of helping pieces that you have on the Clippers. And you haven't really heard much from them. So I feel like they're plotting. I feel like they're scheming. And I feel like they're definitely the team to beat right now. Yeah, fair I enough. Like as long as no one utilizes the snitch line during the playoffs, I think they'll be fine. Um, so switching over to the Nets, uh, how many seeding games do you think they'll win in the bubble? And depending on where they land, uh, seed wise, how many playoff games do you think they'll win? Obviously, the Bucks are not going to win, so likely the goal is for the seventh seed, and they'll either play the Raptors or Celtics. So first, let's start with seeding games. How many think they'll win? And then playoffs, depending on which of the two opponents do you think they could win? I think I think the Nets win anywhere between two and four games. And then I think for the playoffs, I hope they get the seven seed because I think that we, in theory, if we had a healthy team, we would definitely have a chance against the Raptors. I would like to see us play the Celtics. I think that would be a fun series, just knowing how much Karras has their number. But I, here's what I think when it comes to games. And people have asked me this question a lot. I don't see that, that that being the goal for this Nets team. I don't see you know a number of games being what they're striving for. I see their goal as being trying out. I know a lot of people have said this. It's almost becoming a tired narrative on, on Nets Twitter now. But me and Keith have talked a lot about it. It's a tryout, right? And that's what I want to see. I want to see how individuals play in the roles that they're assigned. I want to see players like TLC. I want to see what he can do in the minutes that he's given. I want to see Chris Chioza. Like, is he playing for a backup spot? If you think about things like that, like, if Chris Chioza plays really well, can he show that he's going to be a cheap backup for Kyrie Irving, which, you know, frees up Spencer Dinwiddie to get dealt somewhere else? 
there's all of these things that you can watch. Is Jacques Vaughn, with these depleted resources, going to play himself into a job? Is Jared Allen going to play to stay in the Nets, or is he going to play to get traded to a team in Texas? Is Karis LeVert going to show that he can be the undisputed number one option and take all those shots a game, play 40 minutes a game, and play well in those 40 minutes and not get hurt, I think is a big thing for Karis. I think there are so many little little storylines that you can watch aside from just you know what the Nets record is going to be. And I think those are the things that you really want to watch. I really want to see how players like Adonta Hall plays because these are players that are playing for their next NBA job. They're calls up for, from the G League. They don't know you know, who's paying them their next paycheck, if it's going to be an NBA team or if they're going to be playing in Turkey next year. They are players playing with so much motivation. So I think we're going to see a lot of energy from this team. I think we're going to see a lot of players going out there and just playing as hard as they can to show that they either deserve a spot on the Nets or even just deserve a spot in the NBA at all. Yeah, no, I think that's the bigger storyline that a lot of Nets fans aren't really looking at i think they're more just you know this is a waste of time and all these other things but there's a bigger storyline to be held and i think you nailed it perfectly and jumping past the season what do you think the nets have to do to win a championship whether it be next year within the uh kate let's just close it off at the kd Kyrie era and what moves should they make if any that also includes uh not just the roster but also coaching as well Okay, so I'm going to start with the first thing, and that is ignoring the, the, the trade for a third star, the trade for a Bradley Beal. I'm just not on board with that. Don't. I think we have our third star in, in, in-house. I love Karis LeVert. I mean, the way that he plays, he can absolutely be a third option. Just imagining how many open shots he would get per night with Katie and Kyrie on the court is insane. Moving past that, obviously everyone wants Greg Popovich it's maybe a little more possible than a lot of people are making it seem. I know Nets Daily put out some great stuff about how it might be a little more possible than people are, are talking about, but that is still, uh, it feels like a dream. I would love for Jacques Vaughn to show that he is a great candidate and he's a capable candidate because he already has the relationship with a lot of these players. So it's really just between them two for me, I am not necessarily on board with bringing in an, a, a major outside hire other than Greg Popovich, just because I like people that have connections, and I really don't like a lot of the names that are being floated around, especially a Tyron Lue I'm not very excited about. I think the biggest thing, though, for the Nets is just cr- creating and finding depth that they can play with when Katie and Kyrie need a blow, when the team is you know in, in the third quarter and Katie and Kyrie played all of the first half and they need someone to go out there and both not get scored on a whole bunch and just be a plus, a plus lineup and just to get some points. So I think that's really important. I would like a power forward. I think someone like Serge Ibaka is a dream candidate. Top of my list for sure. He's, he's certainly the top of my list, but he, he's a dream candidate the same way pop is a dream candidate for me. I think if we can solidify our depth and, maybe find a more competent power forward than we have on the roster at the moment. I think that's really what we need to do to allow Katie and Kyrie to win a championship. No, I agree. I, I do think that power forward and maybe a strong backup wing are the two most important positions thus far. So maybe we'll get Roberson on the cheap and hopefully he finally has his comeback season after not playing for quite some time. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. Sean Marks, um, I've seen haters. I still don't get it. You know, look at where we've been. And I'm very excited what comes next. So switching gears just a little bit. Um, so as you've noticed, the Nets have started to acknowledge their history with a guaranteed throwback jersey incoming. Um, and then obviously with Vince Carter retiring, a lot of Nets fans are starting the movement once more to retire 15. So what are your thoughts? Either you can start with either talking about VC, do you think he should be retired? Or you can talk about, as you guys, I mean, you've mentioned recently on Talking Nets, uh, your favorite throwback jersey. So balls in your court. All right. Well, I'll, I'll handle the Vince Carter discussion very quickly. Absolutely put 15 in the Raptors. He is the kind of player that I feel like you have to. I think the amount of eyes he put on New Jersey, on the team, how he allowed the team 
to be on national TV all the time, how he was a reason that the Nets became a fun team to watch and a, a fun team to play for. I think he meant so much to the Nets organization as a whole, even in the short amount of time that he played there. I think he's absolutely in the rafters. I think it would be a mistake almost financially as well to not put his na- number in the rafters because think about how much money you would make on a Vince Carter jersey retirement night. Think about how much money you'd make on a Vince Carter bobblehead night. There's so, so many chances there. And just to be able to acknowledge that he was this great net, this awesome player, this electric player to watch, I think is absolutely important. And when it comes to the jerseys, I like bringing back the Vince Carter era red jerseys, you know, just seeing them with like with the uh, the stripes, like the, the little check kind of pattern down the the like the waist side. But if I had to choose one and I've been swayed onto this after we put out a post on uh, at Talking Nets yesterday, I think if we bring back the Drazen Petrovic era blue jerseys, that That's would my be. Goal. And oh, those are so clean. An absolutely amazing jersey. Those are so awesome. They're so clean. The red, white, and blue would look awesome. They don't even say New Jersey on them. They just say Nets, so there's no reason to not do it there. They're awesome jerseys, and if I had to pick, that's absolutely my pick. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And one thing I wish I asked Keith on, should the Nets bring back a mascot, um, whether it be Sly or just creating something new, because... As much as I want the Swamp Dragons in some capacity, even if it's just for merch, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. No one is giving me any indication otherwise. Uh, I would love the Swamp Dragons to come back. I think that'd be fun. That would be a fun throwback. Can you imagine if Joe Sai came out and said that there was going to be a throwback and then it was a Swamp Dragons throwback and oh, not like a God. Jersey Nets throwback? Can you imagine the riots that would, that would take yeah, place outside say, of the Barclays be a Center? a lot of noise. I think that would be great. I think I think they should. I think, you know, why not, right? That's that's really the way I see a lot of these things with the Nets is just why not? Because the Nets are such a fun team, but they're also such a team with such little, you know, rooted history in Brooklyn that they almost have more ability to do things. Like if you look at a team like the Nets or the Lakers or like the Knicks or the Lakers, they're so rooted and they're so traditions that they almost don't have the chance to do you know fun things like that so with the nets for me it's going to always be a why not approach yeah no definitely and the swamp dragons it's funny that they were the ones to reject their own uh change um so hopefully i mean hopefully washington takes swamp dragons since they're having a name change i think it's a great idea it's a lot, it's a nice metaphor for what's going on in that area but anyways um i i think that's very well said yeah, then I'll, I'll say this about Vince Carter as well. A lot of people, that, to kind of piggyback off what you guys were just debating and talking about, is when it comes to retiring numbers, every team is different. I don't think there's like that statement or that kind of note of that, hey, this is what it takes to have your number retired for this certain franchise. I think what Vince Carter did for this franchise, is considering what the Nets have done, especially in the most recent decade or two decades onwards, he most certainly has to have his number up there. But I'll just leave it at that. But... Thank you, Hudson, again for joining us, man. We really appreciate you taking some time here today to join Doug and I. And, yeah, it's been a blast, man. Awesome. Anytime. Anytime you guys want to have me on. Anytime you want to see, you know, see, watch a Nets game with me. And, uh, and Doug, uh, when I'm back in the area, when things are back opening up, uh, I, will, I will catch you in Carroll Gardens. For sure, for sure. We'll do a pizza tour. Absolutely. And then, Hudson, uh here's your time where could the work our listeners find you where could they follow you just plug yourself out there <laughs> all right well you can follow me on instagram and twitter mostly twitter twitter is where i i put out a lot of my stuff it, at hudson flynn underscore hudson like the river flynn like uh the player that was drafted ahead of steph curry johnny flynn johnny flynn the goat and uh, I think just follow follow at Talking Nets. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter, and go, go to listen to the podcast. Sounds good. Awesome Sounds interviews. good. We've had almost all of the Nets on Yes crew come on to the podcast, and we did a lot of Iron Eagle talk early in the episode. That is probably one of my top two favorite episodes we've ever done of the podcast. And that episode was really more of just an interview. It wasn't it wasn't focused on anything that was happening at that moment. So I think listening to that anytime is something that you should do. He 
if you ever get the opportunity to listen to Iron Eagle, just in general, that's not an opportunity that you should waste. Of course. Well, of course. most definitely. And then we'll leave all that stuff in the description. So if you want to check it out and you didn't catch it, it's all in the description. And Chris, uh, just time to give close remarks. And once again, thank you, Hudson. All right. Thank you guys so much. You got it, man. But guys, feel free to remember sending over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts of any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on our social media channels. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening service. As for next time, stay classy, take care, and keep on staying safe, people. We'll